All right, so today we're gonna to go through a quick agenda, right? This is the supplier panel and we'll do a little bit of an intro and a wrap up here. Uh, we do have some upcoming webinars. We actually have not picked our topic from last week. It's likely gonna be geared at a broker panel. I'm sorry, I haven't updated this slide, but broker panel uh, is likely. What we're gonna be doing next week, focused on mass market and other channels, right? Power Matrix serves a lot of the uh, shopping website uh, uh, brokers as well as door-to-door, uh, -door face face-to-face brokers, and it'll be an interesting perspective to share. So why is Power Matrix doing this? And we've linked up with TIPA to be putting on this webinar series. To date, we've done it every week. We plan to do it weekly or bi-weekly, you know, until this pandemic stops, uh, hopefully, and we all start returning to workplaces. Uh, but we've partnered with TIPA to be able to put this webinar series on because the TIPA members obviously are what pushes this industry forward, uh, both brokers and suppliers and the conversation. So if you're not a member of TIPA, we thoroughly uh, invite you to join these conversations uh, and they have been great in uh, sharing all this information with all TIPA members. Today we, ooh, I did not mean to skip over that. Today we have a great panelist here uh, of all the, you know, three of the top 20, if not the top 10 suppliers in the country uh, with John Bennett from Energy Harbor, Jenny Seif for, from Constellation and Kevin Shannon from Engie. Thank you guys so much for joining this panel. We really appreciate you dedicating your time for this, really do. We know you guys are incredibly busy right now and uh, I think it's just amazing that we're all in this together. And that's what this is, right? This is all about connecting people uh, and this is our core purpose statement for Power Matrix, connecting people through technology to increase trust in retail and energy markets. It's all we do as Power Matrix is focus on retail energy. And this is just on our mission statement. That's why seven weeks ago when all this started, we were already working from home. We've always worked from home. That's uh, our remote workforce that we do at Power Matrix. Uh, and we just thought, how do we, how do we benefit the industry? And uh, we've had some great panelists and continue to grid uh, run some great panels here and some great information being shared. So really do appreciate all the participation. And just for what it's worth, Power Matrix, uh, this is our thought of retail energy. We support 111 energy brokerage firms on Sparkplug, our CRM for energy brokers and counting. Uh, we've launched Propeller as our supplier system uh, about October of last year. We got our first client in December. And the thought really here is, is if we have information exchange, a secure data exchange, if we have systems on both sides, we're right now teaching these two systems to speak to each other and everything from pre-deal to post-deal information. We also are building APIs through this communication platform so that any broker, any supplier in our industry can communicate effectively with each other. And so that's really Power Matrix vision, why we're doing this. That's the last you'll hear. This is not supposed to be a sales pitch whatsoever. Just want to share with you guys why we are uh, doing this today. We've already got over 200 people that are participating in this conversation. Again, just before we kick this off, please use Q&A. Any participant that would like to ask a question, I'll be sure to get these uh, in play as we go through the conversation. Feel free to chat with us as well, and please make sure to fill out the polls. We will be launching our first poll here uh, very shortly. So with that, uh, I kick it off to uh, the first question that we're going to ask the panelists. So today, uh, let's start with John and, and work our way through. Uh, John, what are the top three risks that you see that are facing uh, retail energy suppliers and specifically large ones uh, in this pandemic? I take myself off mute. Thanks, Jason. Um, you know, there, there are a slew of risks and, and I know the other panelists have some um, to, uh, to address as well, but I'm going to hit, hit a couple of them because they kind of work in tandem. Um, obviously, un unprecedented um, uh, economic times, right, with this uh, health crisis. Uh, and so a lot of business, you know, most businesses are shut down. So load destruction is a, is a huge concern, but we've got a load destruction coupled with uh, falling prices is especially um, problematic for suppliers. Um, and especially smaller suppliers and suppliers that don't have their own generation that are um, have to rely on the wholesale market uh, to make forward purchases in that wholesale market. And they they end up holding on to too much power um, at too high a price, and they've got to dump that power into a, a depressed market. So they're bleeding bleeding cash, right? And and that's going to make life very difficult for for a small supplier. 
Um, and if you don't have generation, the difference is you're gonna bleed cash instead of missing opportunity. Uh, over the long term, the two kind of converge and, and become the same issue. Over the short term, you know, it's a it cash, cash crisis is what puts companies out of business. Um, and so that's, that's a real big concern for, for smaller suppliers without, without gen. Sorry, I got on myself too. So yes, definitely suppliers without generation, uh, they're gonna face this uh, position of being incredibly short and or long, right, when they're dumping power back out. And so usage risk, right, what your customers are using uh, is one of definitely the top three risks that we see as well and how that affects retailers. Kevin, how would you answer that question in terms of uh, top three risks that you feel are facing retailers right now? Yeah, I think, um... John hit, hit on one, the volume degradation uh, is key. But I think before that, obviously in a time like this, the health of our employees and partners is key uh, to running a successful business. So that's, that's number one. But then after that, really volume degradation um, and then kind of in tandem with that is under collection of demand-based charges in um, markets where, where there are demand-based charges typically included in a fixed price. And so those, those present challenges um, all related to, to COVID-19. Um, as well as, you know, keeping an eye on customer defaults. I think as it relates to large and small suppliers, um, you know, the larger suppliers are going to have, you know, a larger uh, diversity in their portfolio in terms of customer mix. So we're seeing, a, you know, the, the smaller businesses in the CNI space are, are, are at risk. Um, those are the businesses that are most at risk during a time like this. So if, if you've got a, a, a portfolio of customers that really spans um, multiple SIC codes, multiple sizes, uh, like our portfolio does, it, it, it allows you to be in a position to weather those storm and spread that default risk across, across the portfolio. So, you know, it's key in times like this for, for partners, for customers to be doing business with uh, suppliers that are financially sound, making, um, you know, disciplined financial decisions, like John alluded to, protecting liquidity is key because those, those metrics have, have significant impact on the financial covenants between supplier and wholesale counterparty, whether that be your own generation or not. Um, so those are the, some of the things we're seeing. Absolutely. So yeah, just to reiterate, top three risks, right? Credit usage uh, and uh, the capacity transmission. We actually have a question about that. And number one, for NG, and I love what Kevin just said, we have to put our people first. There's no question about that, right? That, that has to be the biggest risk is, are you going to lose people through this pandemic? Are certain people dealing with certain crises at home? Or, you know, do they not have care? Now their kids are home, so they have, you know, they're tied up. What does this do to your people? I love how you touch on that, Kevin, and really do appreciate that. Uh, we did launch the first uh, poll here and uh, definitely see some responses coming in. This capacity transmission thing, we're gonna explain a little bit further, but before I get there, Jenny, how would you answer that same question? What are the top three risks facing uh, Constellation and, and other large retail suppliers? Yeah, I mean, I think we touched on the big ones. The volumetric risk is definitely a big one. Account receivable risk. And I'd probably add that from the channel partner perspective, understanding how uh, a supplier is managing that volumetric risk, how they're accounting for that is really essential. Um, so as a supplier, we're, you know, we're impacted on our existing agreements that are in place today and how we're able to recoup on costs, but we're also impacted in how we assess those risks and how we account for that on future agreements. So and it's really important for the channel partner who's uh, evaluating offers for future deals across suppliers to understand how the supplier is accounting for that risk. Are you accounting for it through uh, price adjustments? Are you accounting for it through risk premiums embedded within the price? Or are you accounting for it through contract provisions where, you know, if usage changes materialize in a certain way, a customer might see impacts on their bill. And it, it, so as you assess offers, it's really important to ask that question, understand how a supplier is managing that risk, where it's accounted for, who bears it, um, you know, to understand what the potential impact to the customer might be down the road. And if you know it's a period of time where, you know, we're expected, expecting usage to be impacted, um, you know, let's say it's over the, the next couple of months uh, and, and the, the, it's an impacted business that is seeing, you know, volumes decline, a supplier needs to be accounting for that in some way. So you want to make sure the supplier is accounting for that risk so that, the, you know, the, the supplier's uh, able to get through it and you're confident that the supplier will be there on the other side of, of this 
and you want to understand how the suppliers accounted for that so that if you're trying to compare offers and have that discussion with the customer, you can articulate that to the customer. Who's holding the risk and how is it accounted for? Absolutely. And I think so. it's a very interesting poll that I think you guys all can see uh, right now. Panelists, do you see the poll results or does that not share until I end polling? John, are you seeing the poll votes right now? Uh, I'm not seeing the votes, no. Just, just the poll oh. question. Okay, cool. No worries. I'll be sharing this interesting what's coming in. But before I get there, I just wanted to share uh, quick information because, again, it's interesting. A few people on the call did say capacity transmission. What most understand it pretty well, somewhat understand. But this is really what we're talking about, right? This is the illustration of what a normal, specifically PJM, Texas, not so as much, but there's still some pieces of this, but particular PJM in the Northeast, this is the breakdown of what a supplier's costs are. We talk about this fixed price all in product, which is 85% of our industry, according to uh, industry surveys. Uh, and that's really what the customer is paying. But when we price it up, which is this column here, the energy supplier is really having all of these different line items that are baked into that all in fixed price. And specifically capacity and transmission, you'll notice, it's not a price per KWH. So that price, what we priced in, maybe with a little bit of risk in an all in fixed price would be, you know, $300, $125, that would be our cost. And we still expect to make, you know, $20 as a supplier, $50 as a broker. Now the problem is the usage goes down to 8,000 in terms of COVID, those cap tags are static. And so there's still the cost to serve that customer is still this amount. And if you then start to look at what the number should be, the supplier, the broker gets a $10 impact here, but the supplier not only gets the $4 impact, they're actually the difference between $900 and then the cost of all components. So the supplier's actual margin goes negative. And this is to try to articulate the risk that we are actually facing here uh, as an industry. And so one of the questions that has come in you know, on this, and so I'd like, you know, folks to uh, try answering this the best they can. But what do you guys feel is a fair approach to recover stranded capacity and transmission costs uh, in some of those contracts where you do have those provisions? Um, is there a fair way to do that that you feel like you, you know, could, could still benefit the, the customer and help them understand, et cetera? And so let's reverse the order and start off with Jenny on that one. And if you don't feel, please move on. But this is a question from the audience here. Uh, Digby, thank you for the question. Sure. I think it all starts with um, making sure that there's transparency in the contract and the offer that's being provided. So, you know, if, if we're presenting a, a price to a customer and there is a substantial load degradation uh, and we're having to account for that in the price, just being transparent, um, you know, this price is, uh, is increased or in, inflated relative to what it would be under normal circumstances with normal usage. Um, and th to this extent, and, and here's why, you know, we're seeing load come in a lot lower over the last month and we're expecting that to persist and we're accounting for that in the fixed price. And if the customer, if that doesn't make sense for the customer and they think, well, we'll be back to, to running uh, at normal operations more quickly. Um, well, maybe it makes sense to then talk about does, it, does a pass through of capacity and transmission of those demand charges benefit the customer and make more sense. So I think it really comes down to having transparency, having a conversation to understand how that risk is being accounted for, who bears that risk, um, you know, and then making the decision that best fits that customer. Absolutely, you know, it's an individual situation. That's the, uh, that's some, the unfortunate part about this is there's no uniform, you know, overarching, this is what we're doing across the board. Uh, that I've heard from any supplier. Uh, they're all treating it individually and keep, keep on looking at the situations, you know, one by one as they come in. Kevin, uh, any difference in opinion on that or thoughts to share? Well, I, I would take a step back and just talk a little bit more about, about the risk. You talked about the risk of capacity uh, to the industry. And, you know, when you, when you take a nominal value, in your example, $300 capacity charge, and, and you unitize that cost, and convert it to a KWH price, you're actually introducing volumetric risk that prior to that um, exercise was not, was not present. So, you know, we have a situation where um, every single customer, you know, no one knows exactly what they're going to use. We think we know what customers are going to use. Customers might think they know what they're going to consume. And, we, and we, we make projections based on historic values, but the truth is that consumption number is a variable number. 
So when you unitize that, that cost, you're introducing volumetric risk and risk that one you know, scenario could play out where the supplier over collects um, or two, a scenario where the supplier under collects based on that consumption variable. Because again, we've, we've unitized that nominal value. So, you know, really understanding that, that you know, it, I think a, an argument could be made that fixing capacity costs in, in a unitized way actually increases uh, risk associated with, with volumetric variances. So understanding that is key. But I think, you know, back to the original question, um, you know, in, in a fixed price contract where, we, where the supplier has, has fully fixed demand-based charges, uh, you know, there are a lot of suppliers that are going to, they're just going to wear that, that cost and that exposure. And that's why you're seeing some of these smaller suppliers already. Uh, East Coast, I think, was was one I, I heard recently. Is you know they're sending their customers back to the back to the utility. So these these types of risks are are significantly impacting the smaller shops that don't have the again the financial uh, prudence to weather this kind of storm. So, um, but again, like 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 Jenny spoke about, there are, there are other ways that we can uh, we can structure contracts so that there's you know there's clarity. And there still can be budget certainty with uh, capacity uh, transmission or demand-based charge pass-through. I mean, in, in Texas, you know, 4CP is on the TDSP side of the bills as well as, as, as all the other TDSP charges, and, and we don't include that in the energy charge. So there, there are markets where that model uh, is successful. Absolutely, where it's basically the customer wears, the customer bears that risk versus the supplier, right? And hopefully throughout all this, you know, pandemic and, and regardless of how, you know, suppliers choose to operate during this pandemic, hopefully the capacity and transmission will be a more known entity. And Jenny, I know Constellation has taken a brief period here uh, of not, you know, uh, through contracts starting before October, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, that, you know, no fixed price all in and pass through capacity and transmission. Uh, please explain that. I know there's a couple questions from the audience on what that is. No, I mean, it's really at the customer level. So there are certain customers that where it wouldn't make sense, you know, a gym, right? A gym might come to us asking now for a short term or a contract starting in, in June, and we might not think that that makes sense. So there's situations for sure where we wouldn't do that. But as a general, we, we evaluate each customer. Um, if it makes sense, if it's a customer where we can account for that risk in a reasonable way within a fixed price contract, then, then we would offer it. So it really is dependent on the customer criteria. I think you have, uh, we're probably going to talk a little bit about this later, but a lot of it does come down to how much information we can get up front and having that discussion as early as possible. So if we're getting a request for an impact that looks like it's an impacted uh, industry or an impacted business, and there's information about maybe they're using the facility for something else and they're up and running, the more information we can have up front and the, the request for pricing, the more the better we'll be able to respond to that request and maybe uh, customize an offer that fits for, for that particular uh, profile for that particular customer and how they're using energy currently. So I would say we definitely are taking a hard look at the at how uh, facilities are operating uh, currently and over the next couple months. But depending on on what those operations look like, you know, we you know in certain scenarios we absolutely are uh, continuing to offer fixed price. In other scenarios, we might say you know it might not make sense for a couple of months. Push the start date out a few months, or uh, let's look at what might make sense for a short term. Absolutely, that makes sense. So, speaking about specific, you know, geographies and verticals, et cetera, um, you know, John, I, John Bennett, please speak to that uh, in terms of what you're seeing in terms of what specific geographies or verticals are, um, you know, being hit. And uh, along with that, um, if you could also speak to uh, what contract language uh, should customers really look to avoid uh, in these major price adjustments by prospective suppliers from events such as polar vortex or the pandemic. So specific contract language that brokers should be looking for, and especially as it relates to certain geographies or verticals that are being um, maybe not offered a fixed price. Yeah, yeah, uh, Jason, you know, when, when you look at geographies and verticals that are being hit, um, really don't need any uh, energy industry expertise, just watch the evening news, right? Watch watch where the pandemic is, is uh, most prevalent watch where uh, watch the governor's shutdown orders and uh, when those are being eased and, and what exactly they're shutting down. Um, you know, what we're seeing is the uh, commercial accounts are being hit very hard. Uh, industrial accounts somewhat, uh, somewhat less. So uh, industrials 10 to 20% load degradation, uh, commercial accounts between 10 and as much as 40% load degradation. 
Um, one of the things that I would ask uh, that brokers should pay particular attention to is on existing deals, um, making sure that their suppliers are living up to the terms of the contract and not trying to pass something through because it's an economic hardship for the supplier, um, but rather because the contract terms allow, allow them to. Absolutely. And so, you know, with that said, um, do you see a lot of suppliers that are going to be, you know, using things and what, what specifically is it like force majeure that you think would be implemented or was it, was it going to be just uh, material adverse change clauses? I mean, those are the two that I know uh, to answer that yeah. question that I would suggest that, you know, everybody look out for it always, regardless so, of pandemic or not. But um, it, yeah, let me, let me touch on that, Jason. So, um, so Energy Harbor, our, exi our existing contracts have no material adverse change language or, or bandwidth uh, language. When we're passing through charges, whether it be ancillaries or capacity or demand-based charges, uh, we're explicit in, in that um, and, and how we pass those charges through. Um, force majeure. For, force majeure is a provision in, agree in an agreement which protects either party um, when they are unable to fulfill their obligations under the agreement, right? So um, suppliers will not be uh, declaring force majeure in anticipation, and we do not declare force majeure, majeure on, on behalf of our customers, right? So this is something on a case by case, it's a bad thing if you're a broker and you hear that one of your suppliers is declaring force majeure. They're, telling, they're then telling you that they can't fulfill their obligations to, to provide service to your customers. Um, now, a customer suddenly has difficulty paying or uh, meeting their obligations under the contract, and it draws back to uh, the current health and you know, financial crisis we're in the midst. They may make a claim on force majeure, and then, you know, then the lawyers get involved, and, and we have to figure out how we proceed from there. Uh, so it temporarily suspends one party or the other's uh, responsibility f to fulfill obligations. Um, you know, I've been reading force majeure language for 20 plus years. Some of this stuff is truly a kind of shake your head, you know, talking about pestilence and, and things that, you know, it seems that we don't really experience except when we read the Bible. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's the plagues, it's the plagues. All it's over the plague. Again. Well, you know, and, and consider just looking at this from a, a common sense uh, standpoint, um, I, I think most force majeure language actually has the word pandemic. So I'm not an attorney, I'm not going to make it declaration on behalf of Energy Harbor, um, but I, I think we can kind of read these contracts and, and see the plain English that's in there. Uh, very helpful. Uh, Kevin, Jenny, anything to add to uh, that piece of the conversation just in terms of, in general, um, you know, what, what, what specific geographies or verticals are being affected or how to mitigate uh, any of the, we're gonna close out the risk section. So anything else that you wanted to address in that section and then we'll get on to statistics. Yeah, I'll just add to, to John's comment about, you know, following the, the news reports. It's, you know, any, any, um, any capacity market where we have demand-based charges that are, that are typically um, fixed into the, the rate, those, those are, are presenting challenges, obviously, uh, and, and again, commercial real estate with volume degradation there. Absolutely. Jenny? Yeah, I'd echo the any any markets with demand-based charges. Keep in mind, transition uh, transmission is a demand-based charge as well. So New York, New England, PJM, those would be markets where you want to understand how those costs are being accounted for. Um, yeah, and in terms of contract provisions, yeah, I think we touched on. You want to understand what the bandwidth provision is. You want to understand what material change, and then any any reference to usage changes and recalculation or reallocation of capacity or transmission, any demand charges. So you want to understand to the extent there are changes in usage, changes in how facilities being run, um, is there an ability to adjust uh, capacity and transmission or adjust cost uh, prices to customers in any way? So just read the contract, ask the questions, have that discussion with a with supplier, uh, make sure you understand who, where the risk is being accounted for and who bears the risk. Absolutely, that, that is a great point. Definitely continue to review the uh, the question, the, well, the, the, the contract language here. So, uh, so in terms of getting onto the statistics area, um, we're going to start talking about delta in deal flow. So, the current poll that I have launched and people are starting to respond to, please do. This is specifically to look at, and we're going to be asking a follow up question here as well uh, in just a minute here. So, please vote now. This is specifically what your deal flow was last year, right? Looking for a baseline. 
And the next question is gonna be, what's your deal flow been like over the next two months in terms of new business? But I'll start with Kevin uh, and we'll kind of, this is a question I'm sure a lot of folks will wanna answer, but Kevin, what is the uh, Delta in deal flow that you guys are seeing? And then anything in terms of usage variance or bat, the three risks that we've identified, what are you starting to see? What statistics can you share? And you know, there's a lot of questions from the audience in terms of what verticals, right? Commercial real estate and restaurants, if you don't know that off the top of your head, come on, right? So let's talk about what, you know, any other ones that you think are like surprising for people uh, that potentially might be impacted as well. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, post COVID-19, we saw, we saw a drop in, in pricing requests, um, probably about seven to 10%. Um, and that was primarily being driven uh, by re reduction in matrix contracts, right? Because the matrix size customer has been most significantly impacted um, by the downturn uh, post COVID-19, in addition to the nature in which those contracts get executed. That's typically door-to-door -door sales, which in, in most states has been completely uh, brought to a halt. So that was, that was to be expected. So that was the main driver <clears throat> behind some of that um, reduction, but we've really seen it level off and we've actually seen an increase in custom pricing requests and, and new business pricing requests. Uh, so I, I think, you know, that's, that's really being driven by, I, I, I believe, our position um, in the marketplace as a financially sound partner. Uh, we're being viewed advantageously by our partners and customers in a time like this. Uh, we've, we've made very, very few changes to our, our product offering. Um, and so we, we, you know, our goal is to weather this storm and be able to provide the same kind of level of service and products to our customers and partners that we always have. So um, I think that's, that's what's driving uh, that uptick in new and, and custom uh, pricing and specifically requests. specifically the new and custum pricing requests, was that like last two weeks? Like when have you started to see that from a, you know, an increased perspective recent? Uh, how it's, been, it's been pretty steady since uh, shortly after, I'd say a week or two after, after the COVID-19 shutdown, which was what, I guess early March. Gotcha, that's uh, really good information. Uh, JB, same question. Uh, yeah, Jason, you know, we, we Energy Harbor is coming um, into 2020 in, you know, quite a bit of a different position than perhaps NG and, and Constellation having uh, emerged from bankruptcy and split from its uh, utility parent. Um, and so we kind of had been a uh, stay the course mode in, in 2019, especially early in 2019. So if you were to look year over year, um, our activity level in the first quarter um, and for the first four and a half, five and a half months of, of this year has been um, off the charts compared to 2019. That's, that's more a reflection of our, the aggressive growth mode that, that we're in. Um, but when you look more closely kind of month to month at, at what's happened, um, we shifted to a uh, work from home mode uh, about mid-March. Um, and April by far has been, was the strongest month that we had for the year. Um, seeing a uh, dramatic increase in uh, pricing requests, um, contract requests, et cetera. Um, so we're, you know, I'm kind of anticipating that we're going to see a slowdown at some point. Um, e even if it's, even if it's just a pause, I think uh, human nature that it, at some point there's a potential where customers are just going to kind of be overwhelmed at what's going on around them and around us. And, uh, might get to the point where an energy contract is maybe the last thing that they um, want to be dealing with. I think that that will be sort of a temporary blip. Um, so I'm kind of waiting on that. But to this point, and probably driven by some very attractive low prices, um, we've seen a real surge in, in activity. And uh, now I'm speaking uh, specifically to the, the large commercial and, and, and industrial, so not at all to discount uh, Kevin's points on, on um, smaller customers, door-to-door -door activity, uh, et cetera. We've certainly seen a decrease in, in those areas in our mass market business. So they say buy, buy low, sell high, and right now power prices are uh, historically low. Uh, and so that is obviously a good time And the larger customers that really manage their energy budgets. Uh, absolutely. Uh, hard hitting question here, JB, to follow up on that, which is uh, what advice would you give customers who are hesitant to align with a company emerging from bankruptcy? Uh, that question was from the audience and directed straight at you. So I'll give you the floor to, uh, to share that. Yeah, um, that, that's great. I, I think that, um, you know, be more cautious about uh, aligning yourself with the business heading into bankruptcy than one coming out of bankruptcy. Um, 
Our financials literally are an open book. Um, we are a privately held company, but we're committed to full transparency. So our financials are posted on our website. Uh, so feel free to take a look at those. Uh, we come out of bankruptcy in an extremely strong position. We uh, came out of bankruptcy with over a billion dollars in cash. We're still holding north of 900 million uh, with some upside there pending some uh, certain litigation that is active. Um, only upside available there. Um, and we have you know, less than $425 million in debt. So we've got a very strong two to one cash to debt ratio. So look at us um, based on what you see, what, what, the, um, what the financials are showing, what the um, financial community is saying. We hold a, uh, an investment grade uh, rating from, from Moody's uh, and we hope that before too long we'll have a rating from S&P. Um, so um, certainly ask the questions, um, but let the facts and data guide your, your decisions. Yeah, that's very helpful and, uh, you know, definitely appreciate the answer to that. Um, I'm sure the folks in the audience do as well. Uh, you know, again, anything, anything that anyone has to add in terms of specific statistics around what they're seeing, maybe even in bad debt ratio, uh, you know, are you seeing any increase to that? Um, you know, Jenny, Kevin, John, anyone feel free to chime in on this question, but from a bad debt perspective, is it too early to know what you're seeing or are we starting to see some companies already stop paying? their utility bills uh, in some of these harder hit segments and what segments would those be? So I'll start with Jenny, go up the list just in case. And if, if you don't have any statistics to share on bad debt, no problem, just a, a question from the audience. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any statistics in front of me. Uh, you know, we definitely have had requests from customers and are doing our best to work with customers. Um, similar to what the others have shared, you know, we saw a decline the first few weeks and we saw a lot of We've had a lot of conversations with customers about how they're doing, um, what they need, how we can help. Um, certainly in some, some cases, we've already started to work with customers on, on payment plans where needed. So I don't have statistics on that metric. Um, you know, happy to share some of the, the statistics around usage changes um, generally that we've been seeing as that would be helpful, but I'll let, I'll let the other folks answer the, the questions around no, no, that. No, actually, there. please, actually, while you're talking, please hit the usage variance. Yeah. Any of the deltas, that's, that's exactly what the folks are looking sure. for. Any statistics, please. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, looking at the preliminary data, we've seen reductions in CNI load and PJM as an example in the 10 to 15% range. We've seen lower reductions in ERCOT. And then on the residential side, we're seeing a load up in the 5 to 7% range in most regions. And then we talked about verticals. So, you know, gyms, event spaces. Um, you know, those would be examples of, of businesses where you might see a greater than average impact. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, you know, uh, residential apartment complex, hospitals, grocery stores, you, you typically might see a less than average impact. And in some cases, uh, you might actually see low growth. So um, those are just some examples of verticals. And I, I will also say that the ISOs have, have been publishing uh, quite a bit of information about uh, low degradation and what sort of broad impacts they're seeing at the ISO level. So to the extent that uh, channel partners haven't seen that and that would be of interest, that's a good resource to look to as more data gets published and happy to share some of that information at the ISO level if that's of interest with anyone just follow up with us. That's a good point. You know, follow, this is, this is on, on par with the topic here is that I consistently hear this from suppliers. A, there's not one size fits all. B, engage from a broker perspective with your uh, suppliers that you do a lot of business with and start to find out some of this information. The resources are there. Um, Jenny, if you want to share anything with the audience, obviously feel free to send me anything, but um, if you want them to go with you, to you, I love that. If they're working with Constellation, they can go to you for that ISO information as well. Uh, Kevin, anything to share from the bad debt perspective, usage variances, statistics you're seeing at the ISO level, et cetera? Yeah, I think it's probably a little too early to tell on, on the impact to, to bad debt. Um, Although we are seeing an uptick in, in customers reaching out uh, to our, our billing groups to, to you know to ask for for help with their with their payments, and that's primarily being driven by you know, matrix sized customers or smaller businesses that are having uh, significant impacts uh, due to COVID nineteen. Uh, thankfully, you know we're we're well positioned. We we serve a vast uh, majority of Fortune one thousand companies, which are less likely to see immediate impacts in terms of ability to pay and. Uh, shutdowns, et cetera. So again, the balance of the portfolio helps there. Um, in terms of usage variance, 
similar to what, what Jenny stated, we're seeing anywhere from six to 13%, depending on the market, um, you know, down in ERCOT, probably on the lower end of that spectrum. And of course, in the Northeast, you know, New York, where, where uh, communities have been hit the hardest uh, by COVID-19, we're seeing the, the larger, larger variances. It's a good quick follow-up question to that, Kevin, that, that's coming from the audience, specifically in Texas. I know you and I both live down here. Uh, you know, in terms of ERCOT showing a higher reserve capacity, right, 12.6%, which if you guys remember, if you uh, rewind 12 months down in ERCOT, it was like, oh my God, we don't have enough capacity, prices are going to go through the roof, and now it's a little bit of a different story. So what are you guys, and this is a multiple question here, uh, specifically in ERCOT, but anywhere across the country, are you seeing lower prices for customers generally renewing, or are you seeing higher prices uh, right now, and then do you see, you know, crystal ball into the future? What do you see happening here over the next few months uh, in terms of prices against current contracts? Yeah, crystal ball. Um, let me let me pull that out real quick. Uh, I wish I had. But, it. Uh, doing our job. No, you, energy, I mean, so. <laughs> you talked about you talked about um, capacity margins and reserve margins, and 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 so you know that's. That's a, a key metric to watch, uh, particularly as it relates to real-time pricing. And of course, in Texas, it's that's that's when we pay the most attention to it. Uh, I will say we've got you know a, a significant increase in the proliferation of renewables in Texas, which overall has a dampening effect on power prices. But you will see continued intermittent volatility and, pr and scarcity pricing events because uh, you know renewable assets you know are are intermittent and they they can't always be counted on on. You know, the hottest day in August. So I think you're going to con continue to see uh, to see that play out in the market, even if we see, you know, uh, demand degradation with with businesses being continued to shut be shut down uh, in ERCOT during the summer. Really helpful. Very helpful information. I really do appreciate it. Um, John, any statistics to share uh, with the audience uh, that you're seeing? Uh, one thing I haven't heard on, if you can touch on the vertical of hotels. I think it's an interesting uh, one to think about because they'll have less occupancy, no question about that. Um, but in terms of building management, they still are you know, managing their facilities. They've all been you know, uh, essential businesses, technically, to my knowledge. And so do you see anything specifically on hotels? Uh, and then any statistics you want to share? Yeah, I, I don't have um, any vertical uh, specifics, Jason. I will say we will absolutely see an increase in bad debt. Um, that's, there's no getting away from that. Um, I think it's a little too early because there's going to be a lag there. Uh, you know, first companies are going to feel some distress and, and then they're going to start falling behind on payments and then it's going to start showing up in our accounts receivable aging. Um, we do, this is, these are metrics that we as a senior leadership team review weekly. Uh, to this point, we have seen no um, worsening of, of our uh, receivables aging. Things still look good, but we do anticipate seeing that. Uh, you know, we're looking at our top 50 customers um, fairly continuously and assessing their uh, financial standing and, and, you know, what our exposures are there. Um, because, you know, we, we got to be real about this. We're going to see some defaults. Um, one interesting dynamic is, uh, as you all probably well know, uh, the utilities have, have come out as well they should and stated that they will have no shutoffs for our customers that are unable to, to pay. Now, we have um, the majority of our customers are on uh, consolidated billing, so they're paying through the utility. And it would seem rational that knowing that they're not going to be shut off, that if they're having some you know, tightness in, in cash flow, that, that that is a bill that they might put, uh, put on hold for, for a little bit. So we kind of, we cringe a little bit when we hear that um, because I think there's, there are some customers that, that maybe have the cash that they could pay, but they're, they're going to save it for a rainy day a little bit. And that could then kind of transfer that, that stress uh, down the line a little bit. Um, but we'll plan on, on managing each and every uh, one of these cases on an individual basis and try to work as closely with the customer as we can uh, to, to get them through this uh, so we all get through it together. Really helpful. So, you know, to wrap up this, and this is my own two cents here uh, in the statistics piece, from a bad debt ratio perspective, it's something that I've heard consistently. It's a little too early to tell. There's a lot of things we're still nervous about as an industry. Um, you know, my counter argument to, to give the rosy picture is, is we understand all this. We hear these utilities say this as industry professionals. And yet how many customers actually really know that 
you know, are they receiving this message from the uh, utilities uh, as much as we are, right? So there's always that question of how much customers really care about our industry. Um, you know, for the hotels thing, real quick shout out, Scott Burns, thank you for that getting, and this is why I love the, you know, doing this moderation is statistics will start coming in from me. Uh, Scott Burns Marathon's uh, indirect channel lead was sharing that 30 to 50% of uh, usage is being, they're seeing 30 to 30 to 50% reduction in usage in hotels in New York. So specifically to that point, uh, certain verticals are just being hit so much harder than others, but a good takeaway on the usage variance here, brokers that are on the phone um, and then suppliers is that seven to 10% is really what we're hearing uh, overall portfolio effect on usage variance right now. We're speaking of CNI only. If you're a supplier like all three of these folks are that have a residential book, obviously that will be uh, you know, something that uh, varies as well. I also just realized that I haven't ended the polling here, so please uh, <laughs> pardon me here, but I've just ended the polling on the 2019 deal flow and launched the polling to close out this section if all of our participants would start voting on what the deal flow has been over the last two months, and we'll share some of these statistics here as we continue to move on. I bet on that. Uh, all those that are asking questions, thank you so much for this. We'll continue to hit as many as we can hard, but they're, they're flying in here. So definitely appreciate it. So let's move on to uh, another big topic uh, that brokers are very interested in is how are you treating brokers differently? Do you see anything changing in terms of payment structures? Um, you know, are you changing payment structures with upfronts, et cetera? And so for this one, uh, let's start off with Jenny and, uh, and continue. Everyone will probably want to answer this one as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of our interactions with brokers, I would say the main thing that has changed is probably trying to pick up the communications and continue to communicate as much as possible, provide as much information back and forth, keep brokers abreast of, you know, any informa new information we have that might be helpful, any changes. Um, and I would say we, we've tried to do a lot in this area. So um, on March 18th, we had our first coronavirus webinar. On April 8th, we followed that up with an Ask the Experts panel, and we had a special guest join us who had previously served on the State Finance Committee, and he had covered uh, the CARES Act, the Paycheck Protection Program, providing information about how customers can leverage that, who might qualify, how channel partners can, can leverage that. Um, we have uh, some COVID resources, resource pages on our website. We've been sharing content through our channel partner portal, through email. So a lot of different mediums, we know not everyone can always tune in to a webinar. Some people prefer email, some people prefer, prefer phone. So just trying to make the information available through various mediums, continually provide content, uh, FAQs, resources, um, that would be helpful to channel partners, keep that level of, uh, of interaction and conversation open um, and continue to, to, to provide as much information as possible. We haven't really changed the terms of our engagement um, you know, we're continuing to pay commissions as we always have. Um, the new, new changes have occurred there. Um, the, other, the other piece that I would say that, that really has changed uh, on the, in terms of the engagement is the, on the front end, we might be asking for more information if, if we're getting a request for a price, uh, more information we could have up front to, to drive that discussion and, and identify what best makes sense for a customer uh, is always helpful. So there, there might be more back and forth initially when a price request is submitted. Um, and then when we provide price, you know, we're having more of that discussion, you know, are we seeing declines in usage? How are we accounting for that? Uh, if they're getting multiple bids, um, how is the customer assessing that? So really more conversation. And I, you, you talked about hotels and just kind of a, a point there that ties that in. You know, I think that's a fair comment. The hotel industry has definitely uh, been significantly impacted. There are some hotels in New York City that are providing um, uh, shelter for uh, healthcare workers who have come in to, to offer aid and, and maybe their usage is not down similar to, as you would say, like an industry average. So it's really important to have a conversation, understand how a particular account customer is being impacted, what changes they're seeing, if they've made adjustments or they're not seeing the, the, the load reductions, you might expect why uh, and understanding why that might be and how, uh, how that w might look moving forward for that, for that customer. So for us, it's been a lot about conversation and having that discussion. So basically, brokers can assist you in gathering this type of information and having discussions on a one-on-one -on -one basis by having a conversation with Constellation. I uh, echo those sentiments um, perfectly. Uh, Kevin, you know, same question. Have you guys made any modifications in terms of upfront payments? The, the, the community is very uh, getting a ton of questions on this. 
there's also another question here, if you don't mind answering that in this section as well, uh, that NG reported earnings uh, recently, and there was some uh, guidance uh, of countries that you're going to stop doing business in. Um, anything to do with where does North American supply fit North America? So just in terms of how does North America, you know, NG is a, NG, if I pronounce it correctly, is a- uh, It's, it's NG. <laughs> It's NG now? Okay, yeah. sweet. Not NG? All right. Uh, <laughs> it's NG. We've, we've gotten that far. That's great. Um, but in terms of it's a multi-country basis, specifically anything, you know, that you wanted to share about how the North American supply business fits in with that, as well as any changes you've made to partner payments. Yeah, now as far as the global, how, how the North American business unit fits in globally, you know, we, we continue to be, um, you know, to be a star in our portfolio of businesses. Anytime you have a company the size of NG, with you know a, a set of businesses as as diverse as we we have, I mean, we're we're active in every part of the energy value chain from chain chain from from generation you know to supply to services. Um, so any any time you have a, a wide range of of, of business units, and in a time like this where there's increased scrutiny under on liquidity. Uh, you know, there's there's always going to be you know a hard look at what businesses provide the most value, and so that's all that is a result of is, is us you know focusing on on the most valuable parts of our business. Um, NG North America is is obviously one of those, um, and with regards to to commission payments, we're still providing upfront payments. Um, you know, upfront payments are part of that liquidity discussion, so we're always evaluating. Um, risk associated with that. And, and that's on, a, on an individualized basis with partners. And we, we continue to have uh, discussions where needed on that. Absolutely. It's good to know that, you know, and uh, we just launched this poll for the audience. Um, and I'm going to share some statistics and go backwards here. Um, but just in terms of how important upfront payments are to your business from suppliers and this brokers answering this question. Uh, a lot of difference in opinions on upfront commissions. John, you know, launching, you know, relaunching out of bankruptcy, you know, what's your take on upfront commissions and uh, any changes that you're making on how you serve your partners? Yeah, um, Energy Harbor um, in, or any large uh, commercial and industrial third party sales channel I've ever um, had the pleasure of leading has, has never offered upfront payments. Um, and, and particularly because that it had not been the standard, had not been the, the norm. And we've always been careful not to, uh, create the impression that we're offering an incentive to brokers to place business with us um, because it's in their best interest as opposed to being in their client's best interest. We just don't want to create that impression at all. Um, but you know, the, the business evolves, the industry evolves, and there are channels there in the LCI space uh, that predominantly receive upfront payments through their channels, uh, through their suppliers. And um, so we're evaluating that and, and we're um, moving in that direction on uh, sort of a one-off basis where, where it seems to make sense for us um, from a number of different perspectives. So that's more a mat uh, matter of a normal course of business, Jason, as opposed to a response to what's going on in the world. Um, you know, getting to some of Jenny's points on, on what is changing, um, I absolutely agree. It's just a greater emphasis on uh, open and direct, honest communication with our uh, channel partners. You know, it, it's it's always been there. You always talk about that. Uh, today, though, it's it's like it's really this is why we've been talking about it for years. This is why we build the relationships with the the channel partners and and with the customers so that we can work together during times like this. And so, you know, getting back to the risks that we're talking about and kind of bringing it all together, um, we uh, request that our channel partners uh, communicate to us thoroughly if they know that one of their clients is going to be reducing their consumption. Give us a heads up, even though there's no material adverse change, uh, give us the opportunity to manage our business as, as effectively as we can. Um, one of the things I have always done when we have a customer that is falling behind on payments, our first call is not to the customer, it's to their, it's to their energy advisor. Um, and we will continue to do that and working together with the, the broker community um, to, to kind of work through any payment issue that, that we, we might have. Um, I'll tell you as a, as a uh, business leader, um, when I've got a customer that's having trouble meeting payments, um, you just naturally look differently at that customer that has proactively reached out to you 
versus the one that doesn't pick up the phone when you're calling to find out what's going on. So I would just really encourage, uh, you know, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, and that's how we're best going to get through this. Really good point. Yeah, and we, we hope, we're hopefully the brokers will really understand, everybody in this industry is really understanding that this is something that we all have to band together with and to uh, start sharing information. That's exactly what uh, this is uh, specifically for, this, this webinar series and, and others uh, as well. And so there was a question from the audience is, do we see the industry starting to collaborate more? Uh, and really start to work together. That's exactly what this is, you know, webinar is. And, and honestly, I think, uh, you know, suppliers who have, re you know, in the past maybe been a little bit more uh, inside with their information are really coming out and saying, hey, we want to be part of this, uh, you know, rebirth of retail energy and pushing it forward. I encourage every single one of you participants to get engaged with the conversation through TIPA. I had the TIPA Technology Committee. Uh, Jenny's actually a participant in that. Thank you so much. Um, but, you know, in general, this is all about pushing it forward. And I think you are starting to see that in our industry to answer that question from the audience. Uh, another, six, keeping on this partner broker changes, though, uh, specifically, um, do you guys do, let's start with Kevin on this. Do you see that any of, there's a question from Barry Burns, thank you. Um, do you see that any of the suppliers would start actually, you know, having a reduction in staff internally? due to this as a supplier, you know, less support for the brokers? Do you see it as maybe more increase on the direct side versus, you know, are suppliers gonna use this as an opportunity to go more direct? How do you see the people and the support changing internally within, you know, NG? Yeah, honestly, at, at this stage, not seeing changes. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, in certain parts of our business, we've seen, we've seen an increase um, in business and deal flow. Um, overall, you know, we've seen very, two very solid months um, during COVID-19 in March and April. So, you know, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to, to the financial strength of the supplier. Because like I said earlier, our goal is to come out the other side of this, this, this world uh, pandemic and this crisis, um, you know, providing the same level of service that we have always provided. And so um, if, if the smaller suppliers that are, that are less financially stable that don't have the same kind of diversity in their portfolio, um, they may see some, some challenges and you may see some, some cuts in workforce there. But uh, from where we stand, uh, it, it's, it's very healthy. And John, I'm not gonna ask you the question because you continue to come up and grow your organization. You'll be hiring like crazy. So uh, I won't ask that question, but Constellation, uh, Jenny, anything to add to that in terms of you know, differences in staffing and how you, how you go about the different channels, direct and indirect? Sure. Um, very similar response. I mean, we have not made any changes to staffing levels at all. You know, we feel the company definitely is in a strong position with, with Exelon as our parent and a strong balance sheet and, and a high credit rating to, to survive. And, and we're hoping things get back to normal uh, and, and businesses are able to, to continue to, to transact and take advantage of market prices where they are. We, we have not made any changes to, on the staffing side. Really helpful uh, to answer that. Thank you. You know, and so the, another thing to note, right, and then this is thank you, Ira, for making, uh, you know, for, for making this one. But just to note that, you know, I think one of the biggest pieces in this pandemic that's really becoming very apparent is transfer of information, brokers to suppliers. Now, obviously, Power Matrix is exactly what we're working on. Come talk to us if you have those questions. But I really would stress that, and this is from Ira, very uh, known broker in uh, the Chicago land area and uh, one, of, one of our stewards of trying to push the industry forward. And he's making a point that drop notices from the utility need to be on point, sent to the broker immediately, uh, especially during this pandemic, so that they can be noticed uh, you know, when something occurs and that we can uh, continue to proceed forward. So I appreciate you calling that one out. Um, you know, and anything to wrap up from uh, the panelists in terms of you know, brokers assisting gathering info, specifically, you know, we talked about right now, if there is anybody in reducing load, I think that's an easy one. Most suppliers have come out to their broker partners and said, hey, if you can inform us of that, we might be able to, uh, you know, help the customer out more and not have to pass through, you know, charges or changes if it's a little bit known in advance. But another question from the audience is, up front now with new pricing requests, what type of information would you like to see the brokers gather so that you could be more exact with your pricing especially as risk premiums must go up 
you know, in an all in fixed price scenario. So what type of information would you love the brokers to uh, get? Start with Kevin, everybody will have a chance to answer this one. Yeah, sure. Type of business, um, you know, occupancy levels, those are all important statistics. Um, you know, expected closures or current closures. I mean, kind of the, 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 t the typical information you would think of when you're trying to assess um, the health of, of, a, of, a, of a customer's business in a time like this. So that's key. And, and, and just to touch on the, the partnership aspect, you know, it's, I think it's a mindset. Um, it's a mindset of, you know, do I view this as a broker supplier relationship or do I view this as a partnership? And if I view this as a partnership, like any successful partnership, communication is key. So if those lines of communication are open, that includes de you know, details about clients with regards to consumption and expected uh, changes in their business going forward, it, it's, it's absolutely paramount. Absolutely. JB, Jenny, anything else to add there? You know, J Jason, I'll say we, we're really not looking for any additional information. I will um, acknowledge you know, Kev Kevin's point to you know, what type of business is it. I find that's something that I'm looking at closely when uh, a, a credit decision comes to me in assessing is this, you know, what's the, um, what's the future look for the, this type of business, right? So, uh, you know, there are certain segments, uh, you know, that you might not expect. Uh, oil and gas are in distress right now, right? And um, you would otherwise consider that sort of an essential business, but those <laughs> companies that are in that industry or serving that industry are, are in distress. And generally you get a customer name would come, come across. And so you're doing a little more digging. Um, what I would say to the broker community is, is have some patience. Uh, your suppliers are gonna need to look a little more carefully at, at credit. I know we wanna turn around deals very quickly, um, but uh, you also want your suppliers to remain um, financially sound uh, because if they're not and they're making quick and rash decisions, it puts the entire book of business at, at risk, right? So all the other customers that you had signed there are, are at risk. Um, so, you know, it might, might take just a little while longer. Now, the other thing to, to bear in mind is, you know, this, this is a black swan event, right? Truly a, a once in a hundred years, hopefully last time we had something like this in the world hundred years ago. Um, and so we're trying to be very um, thoughtful about what types of changes are we making? And are we, um, are we making significant changes too quickly? Uh, do we stay the course and see how this plays out a little bit? Um, so we're trying to be real prudent not to overreact to, to what's going on and collect information and uh, you know, make some stepwise changes as we go as opposed to making any leaps. Uh, that's incredibly helpful. Absolutely. Um, Jenny, anything to add there? Um, and and if, you, if you wouldn't mind, another question from the audience, uh, I think this is an interesting one and we'll, we'll give a chance for everybody else to answer this too, but uh, Aaron Gardenberger, uh, another broker in the Northeast, uh, is asking about if there is any, um, are you doing anything when you're projecting future usage? And we're seeing the few, he's seeing specifically the future usage on deals being lower and what their, you know, their usage was over the last 12 months. Now for specific verticals, uh, maybe that makes sense, but he's even seeing that in unaffected verticals like multifamily or healthcare. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, is, are you, do you know of anything that's going on on the uh, supply side of forecasting where you would see lower usage in the future, whether that be weather patterns or anything else? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of inputs that go into that, right? So understanding what the industry is, what the region is, uh, is weather norm playing into it. So it's hard to answer that broadly. I would say, you know, for us, we're looking at the specific, the customer specifics, the region, um, you know, number of inputs that go into forecasting what the forward uh, usage product projections would look like. Um, at any customer level, if there are questions, definitely circle that back and we'd be happy to get into discussion around, you know, why we might be forecasting usage, you know, up or down or differently than, than someone else might. Uh, why it might be different than the customer's historical usage, but it's very much dependent on the term. You know, how, how might uh, we forecast usage for a term that starts uh, in, in June? How would that differ than a term that starts in January? Um, you know, so there, so there are so many inputs, it's hard to give a, a blanket answer. We're not doing a, a, a blanket, our forecasting isn't, uh, you know, isn't looking at it as a one-size-fits-all. It, it definitely looks at a lot of different inputs. 
Um, so it's, it's hard. I don't know that I completely answer that question, but I think if there are specifics, come back to us. Um, I can say that for consolation, come back to us and ask questions. Um, that is definitely one thing that we're happy to provide information and transparency about what we're doing and why. Absolutely. And, you know, my only two cents to this is just that uh, from my experience in retail electric suppliers too, you know, we as the salespeople and, and, and at, at the end of the day, sales and, and support of our broker partners is all, you know, the four of us, that's what we do. We all have resources uh, that focus specifically just on usage projections and pricing, et cetera. And so engaging with your suppliers on that uh, is always what I would suggest. I, when I was at a retailer, I'd be going to my pricing desk person and asking that question. But Kevin, John, anything to share there uh, to that question? And we will move on after that um, to the last section just because of time. So. I think Jenny, Jenny hit the nail on the head, uh, you know, taking a customized approach to each, each transaction that comes across our desk. That's key ra rather than painting with a broad stroke. Absolutely. Yeah. And please, John. Uh, I'll, re I'll reinforce that. You know, there, there's a lot of work it, in, during all times that goes into uh, how we price something and, and you're, you're making a forecast. You know, we don't, it, there's a lot of um, mathematics that go into go into this uh, at, at all times. And that just continues in, in you know, what's going on in, in the economy now is just another set of inputs to that. Absolutely. So individualized situations, right? No, no broad stroke answers. That's kind of what you're hearing and engage with individual, you know, situations with your suppliers. I'm sure they'll be more than willing, you know, to help you out with that. And, you know, with that, we also come to this customer engagement piece. And so we will go 15 minutes long. It's so typical if you have a new Jason Beck webinar, you're going to go long. So sorry about that. <laughs> love talking. Great questions from the audience. Love the engagement. Uh, before we get there, just to share some of these poll results that you guys might have been seeing. There's no question that there has been a reduction in new business. So more focus on renewals uh, to, the, to the tune of like a 30 or 40% shift uh, in new business versus renewals. And I'd also like to call out to all suppliers on the panel that, you know, 60, 70, you know, back to John's point about, you know, the residual versus upfront, 70% of businesses, you know, brokers out there are answering this question that it's not very important to their business, but 30% are answering that it is critical to their business. And I would just say that, you know, that's something that each individual supplier has to figure out whether or not they want to support those uh, brokers that are upfront. Now realize, and I can tell you this from my clients specifically, that the newer they are, which also means that, A, there's good and bad with new, you know, new broker shops versus established broker shops, but those new broker shops kind of needed the upfront money, right? They need the upfront money to fund their growth. So that's why you have, you know, still 30% of the industry answering majority of upfront. There are some, you know, brokers that have been established for 10 plus years and they still do upfront because they like to keep the cash flow and, and, and by all means, that's their prerogative. But I will tell you a majority of the ones that are looking for upfront are the ones that are new, those are the ones that are harder to give those payment plans to because you don't know if they're going to be around. So there is that constant dynamic and just wanted to share that, you know, from a statistics standpoint from the polls. So this last poll that we're going to launch here and please continue to stay engaged. Appreciate you guys staying longer on this, but now we're talking about end use customer engagement and we're going to launch two polls here, which is really geared at how well we, and whether you're a broker or supplier, please answer this. How do you think, that those, if we did move from an all in fixed price to a cap trends pass through, how easy is it for the end use customer to understand? Uh, we're gonna look at things, uh, two polls. We're gonna launch one right now that's under a thousand megawatt hours. The next one will be geared at over a thousand megawatt hours. Um, so with that, let's start off with uh, JB and uh, ask the question here of you know, end use customer engagement. Um, Actually, sorry, I apologize about that. Kevin, Kevin, if we can answer uh, that in terms of just how have you seen uh, a change in treating end use customers differently? And Jenny, I'll ask you the same question. Sure, I think we're, we're seeing a, just overall a higher level of engagement. Um, you know, we're, obviously some customers um, need help with paying their bills and we're, we're treating each customer individually and providing solutions in that regard. So. Of course, the interaction on that level has increased. Um, it's also led to you know interaction with clients of our of our partners where where we may not have had prior interaction. You know, customers that are reaching out to to a, a billing group that typically don't reach out to a billing group because they don't have issues and they pay their bills on time. And um, so that that has changed uh, quite a bit. But again, it's um, primarily related to those issues. 
Very cool. Jenny, anything to add on that in terms of just end use customer engagement? And you guys are starting to see these, you know, polls trickle in here. And it's like uh, people are really in the middle uh, and to the front, I think, with the uh, smaller customers. I'll close that poll here in about 10 seconds. So, but Jenny, please, any, any, anything to sure. add on end use customer engagement changes? So we're definitely seeing more uh, customer engagement on the digital side, more, more engagement with digital tools um, and resources that are available. We're, we're seeing more, uh, more interest in video, uh, more use of email, more use of phone, obviously ways to replace in-person meetings. We're seeing more customers use the digital tools that we have available, whether it's energy manager for commercial customers or my constellation for residential or uh, the channel partner portal for channel partners where we're seeing more engagement and more use of digital tools, uh, tools like e-signature to help transact uh, remotely. Uh, we are fully enabled to support remote, uh, continue to remote uh, work and transactions and we're seeing more engagement from customers who maybe were reluctant in the past to use uh, so some technologies that are available or some, some digital tools that uh, you know, that, that they were less comfortable sort of transitioning to and, and, a, and an uptick there and, and a willingness or interest in, in leveraging those tools. Absolutely. You know, online tools are becoming more, you know, available uh, for brokers and for end use customers. And I think that uh, engagement in those tools during this time is uh, incredibly specific. You know, you don't want to just hit your customers with bad information. Hey, this card is going to be increasing this, this, et cetera. So it's nice to kind of tie those two messages together, right? hey, there's this event happening, but there's this really cool resource for you and this is how you use it. So taking that opportunity sure. to make the factor approach. Hey, and, and I would say, you know, we, we've tried to be as proactive as possible. So, you know, sharing information with customers about the CARES Act, Payment Paycheck Protection Program, um, just, just being a resource. Um, you know, one thing I will touch on, you asked the question earlier about how brokers can help. I think anything brokers can do to be proactive with customers, um, you know, do they have open receivables? Take a look at that. Um, you know, it, it ultimately drives down and impacts the channel partner. So if you're getting paid on a residual and there's delay in the customer's ability to pay, you're seeing that on your end as well. And that's, you know, there, there's definitely reason to work co collaboratively there and be proactive. I think it, it benefits all of us. Um, customers appreciate the upfront engagement, checking in, asking how they're doing. Are they are they okay? Do they need someone to help walk them through online payment for the first time? So I think there's a lot of room for collaboration across channel partners, customers, and suppliers, um, and, and we're seeing that. Absolutely, JB Dad. Yeah, uh, Jason. Interesting story. So I was on a, a call with a, one of our partners uh, last week or the week before. And we were asking the question of what their experience has been to, through all of this and in trying to engage new customers. Um, and they explained how, uh, by virtue of the type of service that they had, uh, that they provide, that it was really uh, important for them to be able to get face to face with new customers, to, to convey their value proposition, to kind of strut their stuff. And they said, and so, you know, we're kind of on hold in terms of growing the business. We're going to have to wait till, quote unquote, this is all over. Um, and what I would say is I would strongly advise whether you're a supplier, whether you're a customer, whether you're just someone hanging out at home to start, you know, proceeding under this thought of wait till this is all over. Um, first off, I don't think, quote unquote, this is going to be all over for quite some time. Uh, and we're not going to go back to the normal. It's going to be a new normal. It, it's going to, there's going to be things that are forever going to be different. Uh, we can see it already, things that we're learning in how business works now. Uh, so many of us spend a lot of time traveling and, and we're finding that, geez, maybe all that travel isn't so necessary. Um, and so I think, the, I think the business model, the economic model is going to fundamentally change. And I think it's imperative for all of us to uh, continue to pit, push forward and, uh, and operate business as, um, as normally as we can, regardless of what's going on uh, around us. There's no, there's no, no waiting. Uh, find the tools, implement the tools, leverage the tools today. Great, great feedback. So with that just being a little over time here, and we'll go towards wrapping up with this last five minutes, you know, uh, the polling, thanks for everybody for participating. I think you guys can see uh, I'm sharing results here. You know, when we look at over customers over a thousand megawatt hours, uh, you know, the, the majority of people are still kind of in this middle, which I think is really important. And I've seen the polls, I'll show you in a second, but 
in terms of the under 1,000 megawatt hours, it's a little bit about the same with a little bit more of, hey, there are a lot of customers that already understand, right? Less, we, we figured that. But I think the key takeaway here is that if you see this poll for over 1,000 and then I stop sharing results and let's go to the under, right, and share results, uh, you'll see again, the majority is 48, but now there's nobody in the over and not a lot in the under. The key takeaway here is, is everyone saying with more training, they, they would understand enough to gain the sale, right? And that's 50%. So my, listen, I hope that Jason Beck has done something in terms of, you know, this slide, which will be made available to everybody to start helping people understand things. But Jason is not the best marketer in the world at all, not even close. So I do hope that you three, as well as any other supplier on the phone, thinks about this with their marketing department uh, of providing a one pager of how do you explain this to an end use customer to help them understand risk versus rewards on capacity and transmission. I've seen a bunch of online resources. Kevin, shout out to NG specifically. I feel like website wise, lots of great resources there. Constellation's talking about things that they make available. Obviously with Energy Harbor, you're gonna see a lot with JB getting into that. Uh, fold within the last few months in terms of resources, but I encourage the entire industry to try to help explain this to end use customers, and that's the key takeaway there. Um, I will allow this is this is uh, I will allow good, good lord. Um, this last five minutes, let's go ahead and uh, if anybody wants to uh, raise their hand and ask a direct question, we'll open this up for direct questions. Um, also, while I'm doing that and seeing who raises their hand, uh, I would ask JB, Kevin, and Jenny to just review the Q&As uh, that are coming in. If there's any one of these that are still left that you would like to answer specifically, uh, just please let me know um, and uh, who it's from and we will uh, get those answered. So is there any attendees that would like to uh, raise their hands and ask a direct question? We'll open up your uh, phone line. And uh, any, any of these Q&As that we would like to address. There's some really interesting questions here, very specific uh, questions as well in terms of contract language and other things. Um, you know, I'll answer this one for right now. You know, any word if the government will make cash available in a stimulus package to help suppliers with bad debt. Honestly, I feel like uh, industry-wise retail suppliers are just far from on the top of the radar of uh, the government. Uh, we, you know, there are suppliers that have qualified for PPP and EIDL. Jenny said that, you know, Constellation made a resource available for that. So I encourage people to look at what those programs are, you know, that is something that uh, I don't think, unless anyone has a difference in opinion that I've heard anything in terms of uh, bad debt, you know, stimulus package. However, uh, in Texas specifically, I'd like to call out that there is a program uh, that is being made available to make sure that the suppliers uh, do get made whole from residential uh, bad debt, uh, people that, you know, can't pay their bills. Uh, Kevin, anything to add to that one specifically that you'd like to talk about in, in Texas? I know it's more residential than commercial, but um, no, I don't think so. Uh, is, here's a great question. Young Kim, uh, always want to shout out to uh, my dear friend Young, uh, who is trying to push this industry forward with statistics. But the question here is, is any, is any of the three of you uh, specifically in serious discussions to uh, acquire any distressed retailers? Are you seeing a lot of distressed retailers? East Coast Power and Gas is the first one that we've seen gone, go under. Uh, Texas, I've heard, is actually a little bit better of an environment. I've had more usage, not as much load degradation as in the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, so geography rise, that's what I'm hearing. But, you know, John, Kevin, Jenny, Ke let's start off with Kevin and all three of you guys answer that one. Sure. I think, well, if, you, if you look at the history of, of all of the largest retailers in our country, I mean, there's always, um, you know, there's been a propensity to look at opportunities for growth. Obviously, M&A is one of those. Um, you know, we do, I do expect to see, you know, some fallout um, from, from the events that are, that are unfolding before us with regards to some of the other suppliers that are maybe smaller and their ability to weather the storm. So that's going to create opportunities uh, for M&A across the board, I believe. Absolutely. And uh, Jenny, John, any, any serious discussions? We, we have not had uh, any, Jason. We had kind of come into this year pre-COVID um, with the intention of aggressively growing our business organically. Um, that said, you know, we're led by a, a very savvy um, uh, executive leadership team that's going to look for opportunities at all times. So, uh, you know, the landscape has changed considerably, and that could always change our strategy moving forward. 
Absolutely. Jenny, anything to add there? Uh, can't hear you. Audio went out. Sorry about that. Yep. No, not much to add, really. I think the company will continue to look at opportunities that make sense. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, there's nothing I can speak to in terms of anything we're looking at currently, but I, I think we'll continue to, to look at opportunities if they arise and, and they make sense for the business. And, you know, our platform is definitely one where we've acquired companies and are well positioned to do that. Uh, and, you know, if, oppor if opportunities present themselves, I think we'll continue to look at those. Awesome. Uh, very cool. And really appreciate the answers to that. Um, another question that popped up here, and this will, we'll, again, we'll, we'll try to answer some of these afterwards. There's a lot of specific questions that we didn't get to around different products and terms and things like that that are being affected. But uh, is, uh, John, are you thinking, uh, is, is there any thought here to, um, uh, if you guys are looking at buying any or operating any uh, brokerage firms, uh, you know, through this? So, you know, Breaker Box with Constellation, right, right. Is, is the arm. NG has a COVA, and specifically to you, is there anything uh, that you would add to that from your perspective? No, we, we've got no intention of, of getting into the, the broker space. We are building our business um, uh, on, you know, through third parties. Um, we do some direct sales. We've had some, we've got some very nice direct customers and we'll work very hard to, to retain them directly. Um, but our future growth strategy is, is, um, uh, is through the broker channels. Um, and so we, you know, we got a lot of low hanging fruit before we start thinking about going direct. Now, if we were thinking of doing direct sales, I think the broker model makes sense. Um, but we're, we're going to leave that to others for the foreseeable future. Interesting perspective. Now I will add, and I don't mind to say that differently, NG and Constellation, please make sure to, you know, jump in here with Kevin and Jenny, but you know, honestly, for me, I don't mean to say that in any sense of bad way. I think that the, from my perspective, Jason Beck's two cents opinion, any supplier that has launched a brokerage firm has done so with such um, mindfulness of the broker and keeping that front and center. You know, Nextera uh, had said, hey, we're just not going to take any business from, our, from these two brokerage firms that we bought at all, right? They came out with a public statement. COVID has been around for just about, you know, <laughs> forever. Uh, and I know there's a very strong wall in between those two firms. And Breaker Box, you know, brand new, but I know that Constellation is going to do that as well. So I would encourage brokers, uh, you know, especially with these larger retailers that are thinking about having another arm because, hey, brokerage make a lot of money at the end of the day, more than suppliers on an individual deal. Suppliers have more volume, but, you know, on an individual deal, we know what the, we know what the delta is there as an industry. Um, so anyway, anyway, I just would encourage everybody to not look at that as a negative um, unless they started to see some of their clients being taken over directly. That would be a key indicator. But before that, uh, I wouldn't really uh, get nervous about that. But Kevin and Jenny, anything to add there with your you know, brokerage arms that you guys have? Uh, just, uh, yeah, NG Impact, formerly COVA, just to, you know, for, for clarity, yes. the, the, uh, the energy procurement part of their business, aka the brokerage part of their business, is, is a small percentage of their total business and, and, and one of the many services they offer. So I feel like that is fairly unique and, and different from some of the other um, supplier broker relationships are, that are out there. Absolutely. Jenny, just being breaker box, being a, a little bit of a newer uh, entry into the market, anything to add there? Not really. I mean, it, it's kept very separate from Constellation. So I don't know what their plans are. I don't have any insight into that. Um, you have to reach out to them. And I think that's by design, right? So to, to what you're saying, I, I, I can't really speak to it. I don't have much information, um, but I'm sure if you guys reach out, are curious and reach out to Breaker Box, they, you know, the, the, they, they might be willing to share some, some information. I don't know. Absolutely. Again, there is, there is a huge wall and I've, I've, I've echoed that, but we, at the end of the day, we, as, as people who support the broker community, we need to understand that that is a, a risk that they, you know, see as a risk, right? As a true risk to their business of, you know, you have the data and what can you do with it? But again, I've, I've never seen any um, malice in the industry personally, although I have had brokers absolutely tell me about specific situations. So just always important to share our problems, our risks, and come up with solutions for them as an industry as we continue to move forward. So with that, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, again, there's a lot of open questions here. Uh, we've got 30 plus questions. We've tried to answer as many as we possibly can. So 
Uh, I'll encourage you guys to reach out to these panelists. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you, whether you work with them or not. In fact, if you don't work with them already, I'm sure they'd love to hear from you, uh, people that support the broker community. So uh, we will make all of this uh, available um, and the contact information of these, of these panelists if they so choose to share with the audience on our Friday webinar, uh, sorry, our Friday distribution tomorrow. Uh, and to wrap this up, SparkPlug, you know, is our cloud-based solution for retail energy brokers. And we talk about what are we doing for brokers as an industry? Um, you know, again, some are choosing, hey, we're not gonna pass through uh, changes, right? And changing laws, and that's what we're doing to benefit you. We're not gonna put your customers back to the utility. Those are still positives in today's day and age when you have things like East Coast going out of business. Um, but specifically what we decided to do was offer our SparkPlug stimulus package, give our brokers better ways to communicate with end use customers through knowing more about that customer and getting EDI HU, historical usage to know more about the customer, as well as digital signature, because you're not gonna be able to get, go to them and in person and get a uh, actual signature. So uh, John, Kevin, or Jenny, anything in final closing statements, closing arguments here, uh, John first, and we'll go down the panelists list here. Um, in terms of anything you guys are doing for brokers specifically that you'd like to call out? Uh, no, I, I don't, not, nothing we're doing for brokers specifically. I, I will close with this, uh, Jason, though, that, um, you know, it's, I, I've had an opportunity to talk to, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone daily with, with brokers, with uh, members of my own team, with, with customers, with business partners, literally on calls with people around the world. Um, and there is this degree of, of connectedness through a shared experience um, that's really bringing kind of a, a level of humanness to, to um, the interactions that I think has been missing from business for, for a while. Um, you know, I, I mean, you're talking to someone halfway around the world and, um, you know, you can hear the, the dogs and kids in the background and just this idea that we're all going through this together is very palpable. Um, and you can just feel it on, on every call and in every interaction. I think it's, um, it's a shame that it took a, a pandemic to, to finally get us here. Um, but I am uh, very hopeful that that is something we take out of this uh, and, and retain as we move forward. Uh, very cool. And, uh, you know, I, listen, I, I really do want to allow one, at least one person. So, uh, Michelle Castro has raised her hand and I'd love to get her question if you don't mind. Michelle, please, your line is unmuted. You're the first one to actually have uh, you know, spoken here. So please uh, ask away. Um, I think you need to unmute yourself, but I've allowed you to speak. Michelle, question? Going once, going twice. All right, we'll have to figure out why that uh, didn't work, but thanks, Michelle Castro, for raising your hand. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, it looks like it's still on mute. So, um, all right, so um, please, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Kevin, answer with uh, closing arguments. I'll just say, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to work in an industry that, um, you know, that's still vibrant. Um, Although we're faced with challenges, you know, we're, we're going to get through all of these challenges with our partners, with our customers, with our employees. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's quite a few people hurting in our country right now, um, financially and in other ways. And uh, just grateful that, you know, we're in a position in an industry that's, that's still vibrant through a time like this. I cannot echo those sentiments as, uh, enough. We are so lucky and we need to be doing anything we can to uh, help others in these times. So great, great sentiments, Kevin. Appreciate that. Jenny, anything to share in closing with the audience? Yeah, I'll, I'll also echo the, the positive side of things. You know, we've seen so many people adopt and learn to get comfortable with new, new technologies. We see people doing uh, Zoom happy hours or Skype happy hours. Um, and we also have a big culture of giving back to each other and the communities. And, and we've seen people really find creative ways to do that, even in challenging times. So whether it's, you know, we have colleagues who are sewing masks or mask extenders to, to those in need or, uh, you know, colleagues who are mentoring students virtually. I think, you know, as an industry, I think we're, we're very, you know, grateful and lucky to be in a position to continue to, to, to work remotely, um, to support customers, to, to support channel partners. 
um, and, and to support our communities and continue to, to find ways to engage with each other differently. And, um, you know, hopefully some of this will, will lead to some lasting benefits and lasting improvements over time. You know, Jenny, couldn't echo this more. I think we should all take this as an opportunity as an industry to figure out what we can do better, how we can support each other better, uh, and uh, completely echo your sentiments. So with, with a closing statement from me here, I can't thank the panelists enough. John uh, Bennett from Energy Harbor, Kevin Shannon from NG, and Jenny Seif from Constellation. Thank you so much for your time in all of this. Uh, the recording of today's webinar will absolutely be made available. Uh, through our uh, YouTube channel, as well as an email will go out tomorrow, uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, and uh, we will continue to share with you our next uh, webinar panelists here. We also have this whole Harvard, Harvard Business Review, which has just helped so many uh, people in terms of uh, managing remote staff. Uh, and again, any of the panelists that want to make anything available, resources for our participants, we're more than happy to share uh, in our email tomorrow. For all those that ask questions, but unfortunately we didn't have time to answer them, uh, I will be sending those leftover questions to our panelists. Uh, and uh, if you've shared your name, uh, I will also share their e the email address so that they can get in touch with you guys directly. So again, thanks so much for the participation. Really apologize that we haven't been able to uh, touch everybody here. But with that, I thank everybody for their participation. Uh, Power Matrix appreciates all this. Uh, engagement that we've had and really pushing this industry forward through these conversations. So thank you very much. With that, cheers. Great day. Please Thanks, support. Jason. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank support you, Jason. Local Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Support local restaurants and support healthcare workers. That's what we got to do. Yes. Cheers. Evan, Jenny, uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Take care, everyone.